the uh, Titanic is actually located at a depth of about 2.5 miles, which is, you know, 5,000, uh, which is about 3,800 meters. And at that area, in that location, um, you're experiencing very high pressures. Just to give an idea, if you compare the pressure to the pressure which we have in our tires on cars, it would be 400 times that. So you can imagine that so we're talking about about 5,800 PSI pounds per square inch compared to you know 30 to 35 pounds per square inch in our tires. So that's a extremely large pressure. So that means any kind of vessel which is operating in that area will experience literally tons weight on the hull and the vessel. Um, of course, it's also pretty cold there and it's pretty dark. So it's a very extreme environment. Well, so the distinction between a remotely operated vehicle or a, uh, let's say, robotically operated vehicle and a um, human operated vehicle is, of course, on the robotic side, you do not need to provide for an enclosure or sort of a habitat or a capsule in which you can sustain life. You basically just need the electronics <clears throat> and um, it doesn't even need to look like a um, submarine. And uh, therefore you can go to great depths because the pressure simply can't sort of put its force onto an enclosure because there isn't any. Of course, if you use a human operated submersible, <clears throat> excuse me, then you, of course, need to provide for an environment in which people can survive and are comfortable, oxygen supply and so forth. That means in the end, you have an enclosure. That means you have a cavity, you have a hollow space. And at that point, the pressure will be all upon you. So if we look at the recovery efforts, um, everyone of course is familiar with the proverbial needle in the haystack. In this case, it's far worse, far more challenging. So the area which apparently has been searched um, was the size of the state of Massachusetts, about 10,000 square miles. So imagine finding a large van or so, a large truck um, just in this entire state um, that's already a challenge, but now this challenge gets exacerbated by what gets um, exponentially improved, or I should say this uh, challenge is far worse because now you have to multiply this area by the depth. That means you're now searching a volume where you not only have the area on the surface, but you also have about four kilometers of depth beneath it. That means you're now looking for the needle in an entire volume as opposed to just a surface. So in that sense, um, you're of course relying um, on technologies such as sonar, so sounding techniques, and um, they have a certain resolution or also limits of resolution. So if you use long wavelength um, sonar, you can reach larger depths. If you do a short range, then shorter depths, but the resolution at the longer range is less than it is at the shorter range. So you have that challenge. And of course, the other issue is um, the sonar basically works almost like a flashlight. We have a cone of the sound going down and it's a certain opening angle. That means it's a so-called swath with which you scan the ocean floor. That means um, you can sort of have a search or rectangular search grid which is sort of partitioned in these widths of the swath. Um, but of course, it's sort of a directed or it's a deterministic search. We go in a rectangular patterns in the hope that you find something. What would of course be in these situations preferred if available is that you kind of hear any kind of sound or you find any uh, indication that there might be something in which case you can combine all your resources and focus them on an area where you have a high likelihood of finding something, in which case you can sort of make the search mesh much smaller to then uh, find an object. 
So the analogy which I use with Massachusetts is only area wise. Of course, all our land surface is of course wonderfully mapped by satellites at great resolution. The oceans, not so much. So the deep sea is still um, to exploration. We probably may know more about our um, solar system than we might know about our deep oceans. So in that sense, um, it's much more challenging. And um, of course, you also have to keep in mind that the ocean is a dynamic environment. It's liquid, there's currents, and so therefore things can move. They're not steady as you look for them. And another aspect is that an ocean is not quiet. So there can be lots of noise generated by either animals in the ocean or other, um, let's say, human caused noises or just noise by, generated by nature itself. So in other words, there will be superpositions of noises which you have to basically distinguish and analyze to distill the uh, noise or the sound signals you're actually after. So when you want to explore a uh, extreme environment, how do you prepare yourself? Well, the way I look at it is you have to learn a skill set, sort of a tool set with which you can encounter and mitigate and negotiate the unexpected situation. So basically, very similar to space exploration, when you go into deep oceans, you sort of have to expect the unexpected. So you cannot just go in with a pre-thought out plan saying, if I encounter this, I do this. Um, you have to also give space to sort of something which you haven't anticipated, and you basically have to learn a skill set to then negotiate these challenges. An example would be that one of your, one of your navigation systems fails, or one of the thrusters fails, or is malfunctioning. So you need to be able to then work and know your vessel very well in order to then mitigate that situation. Um, to sort of, despite the presence of a faulty equipment, you can still uh, come back to safety or you still fulfill your mission. So the um, very tragic incident uh, which just happened um, will probably um, inform of deep sea exploration um, of course, one needs to learn from that, um, and it will certainly inform um, the design of uh, submersibles. It will inform um, safety checks. It will inform sort of similar to aircraft where you do a pre-flight check before you take off. Um, it will inform that, and um, but of course, it also point towards. Um, the use or the increased use of robotic vessels, such as ROVs, uh, where you can actually not, where you can basically explore the ocean or you can actually sort of do mining on the ocean floor. For example, manganese nodules is now a big upcoming industry to harvest these nodules from the ocean floor. You can also do other resource prospecting, such as methane clathrates, which is methane ice. So if you were to bring this up to the surface, you can actually put a match to it and it will burn. Um, of course, carbon dioxide emission is a different issue altogether because it's after all a fossil fuel. But never, nevertheless, though, there's vast amounts of that beneath the ocean floor. So for prospecting, for exploration, but also for maintaining cables, which are going from one continent to the other, such as glass fiber cables for communication and data transfer, those need to be maintained as well. So there's plenty of opportunities to use increasingly robotically operated vehicles. And of course, as I mentioned before, you do not have to take care of providing a space that is safe for human to operate in because you just use the robot. Well, one thing which is very important to note is that just like space exploration, 
subsurface oceans or ocean exploration, deep sea exploration is inherently a risky endeavor and it will always remain risky regardless of how technology evolves. So one has to always keep this in mind. So it's something which you cannot just overcome with technology. You can get better at it, but it will always be a very challenging, risky environment and one has to respect that.